generally any message that over relies on too many numbers is not very effective. It's been said that stories sell while numbers know. I think what's really important for people to understand and from a messaging storytelling point of view, it's not like at below 1.5, we're safe and beyond 1.5, we're screwed. It's more like we're on the CO2 highway. And if you miss your exit on a highway, what do you do? You slow down and you get off at the next exit. I'm Richard Delavan, and this is Wicked Problems, a show about climate tech, stories and conversations about the intersection between politics and people, capital and technology that will help shape the future and whether you'd want to live in it. I won't call it natural gas because that's a PR term that's good for that industry, but it's nothing natural about digging up billion-year-old methane and releasing it to the atmosphere in the blink of an eye. If you're waiting for technology to save us, it's a mistake. We've got to go to war with the army we have. The technologies we have right now in solar, in wind, in battery storage, or energy efficiency, really important, and we've got to use them now. After months of headlines of unprecedented extreme weather events, wildfires in Spain and Greece, followed by wildfires in Canada that turned skies in New York orange, followed by a month's worth of rain falling on the Big Apple in three hours, Followed by a storm so intense, we learned a new word from the World Meteorological Organization, Medicaine, a Mediterranean hurricane, a term we'd like to unlearn, except that it led to the flooding that caused deaths of thousands of people in eastern Libya, followed by another hurricane that picked up 100 miles an hour of wind speed in just a few hours before ravaging Acapulco in Mexico, followed by surface temperatures breaking previous records by gobsmackingly bananas amounts for September and October followed by global sea temperatures, six standard deviations above the mean. And no one even knows what colorful metaphor to use for that. Followed by, followed by, followed by. Halloween week made things even scarier, if not surprising. Two controversial research papers, one in Nature from Imperial College London, another in Oxford Open Climate Change, led by James Hansen, said we have decades less time to cut emissions to get to net zero. If we want to stay under 1.5 degrees C of warming, if we haven't passed it already. In the words of James Hansen to the media last week, 1.5 is deader than a doornail. So like a lot of people, I wanted to turn to some of the smartest people I could find to see what they thought. The narrative we're telling about climate and climate tech, that it can be solved, and it's worth our money, our time, and our hope into efforts to solve it. How do we convince people the world is a fine place and worth fighting for together? rather than it's every man for himself in a world where life will become increasingly nasty, brutish, and short. If the new research is right in saying that 1.5 degrees C is in the rearview mirror, what now? I managed to put that question to journalists, researchers, academics, and others in London, in Norway, in the U.S., and other places. Shannon Osaka in the Washington Post reported on the trend of climate scientists shedding some of their native caution, calling it outright an emergency or crisis. One of the people the Post quoted was Susan Joy Hassel, director of the consultancy climatecommunication.org. I've seen Hassel speak on TED Talks, on the BBC, read her co-bylines with the UPenn climate scientist Michael E. Mann, and so much to my surprise and delight when I asked Susan, she very generously agreed to speak to us. She's an award-winning climate communicator and author. For more than 30 years, Hassel has helped scientists translate science into English, making them more effective communicators themselves. In her own right, she has become an authority in the field by making the complexity of climate science clear and compelling for the public and policymakers, for which she was made a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Geophysical Union. She's written and edited reports, including the first three U.S. national climate assessments, testified to the U.S. Senate, written an HBO documentary, and publishes regularly in titles from The Guardian and Independent to The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Scientific American, amongst other places. And this year, she was named Friend of the Planet 2023 by the National Center for Science Education. I was running back from an event at Chatham House where Aksharati of Bloomberg and Solitaire Townsend of the consultancy Futera were speaking on the issue of climate and climate solutions storytelling right before my conversation with Susan. You'll hear a couple of references to that thrown in. I'll have more to say about that and Aksharati's new book, Climate Capitalism, in our next episode. But this conversation stands on its own. Do subscribe at news.wickedproblems.uk to hear more of these conversations and to get our newsletter. And you can follow the show wherever you get good podcasts. 
We're really grateful to Susan Hassel for this conversation, which I found to be a really good sanity check and a source for inspiration. I hope you will too. Here's our conversation. Susan Joy Hassel, I'm so delighted you could join us, such a fan, for such a long time. We reached out because this week, new research dropped indicating that some of the climate models that we've all been thinking are the mainstream for the last few years, turns out may have had a flaw in underappreciating the role of aerosols in keeping down the temperature. It was such a big deal that it caused ripples around the world. The BBC covered this, Washington Post, The New York Times, The Guardian, etc. And I think that as I've been talking to people throughout the rest of this week, We're still getting to grips with what this might mean. So when the Washington Post contacted you for your reaction, what did you think? Well, they were actually looking at a couple of things. They were looking at the paper you're talking about, which does suggest that things look worse than we thought. And that's actually a common refrain among climate scientists, that things are worse than we thought. And that's not really hard to understand because... Scientists are pretty conservative by nature. They don't want to overestimate. They tend to err on the side of least drama. I always say they are not prone to hyperbole at all. So it's funny when people call them alarmist. They're the opposite of that, right? Right. And and then there was this other paper um, that talked about how we've crossed certain thresholds, that we're in uncharted territory. And they use the term emergency quite a bit. That This is a climate emergency. And I said, absolutely, it's an emergency. An emergency, it, it is literally an emergency. An emergency is something that requires immediate action, right? So we are there. It is a crisis. And I also told them, though, that it didn't have to be this way. Mm. We were not in a climate emergency 20 years ago. And if we had simply done what the scientists told us we needed to do, phase out fossil fuels, deploy clean energy, protect our forests and natural lands, this would not have turned into an emergency. So this is an emergency we have brought on ourselves. So this this notion that we had until 2050 to bring emissions to zero, mm-hmm. I, I don't know that that's, it was ever really that great of a message because, mm-hmm. yes, we were going to have to be at zero by 2050, but we needed to start cutting immediately. Emissions right. are still going up. We need for them to come down and we need to come down a lot, like 7% per year, which is unprecedented historically, quite difficult, but possible if we were to really commit to it. Now, for insiders in the climate space, this kind of messaging around 2050, net zero, one and a half degrees Celsius, Mm -hmm. it's common, right? I'm not sure that any of that is well known and understood among the general populace. People like my mother or your Uncle Mm -hmm. Bob, right? To me, generally, any message that over relies on too many numbers is not very effective. It's been said that stories sell while numbers known. But the simple, clear message is that we have to do as much as we can as fast as we can. And the simple message that came from that bioscience paper that I mentioned is that time is up. Emissions need to start falling now and keep falling every year as rapidly as possible. We need to zero them out as soon as possible. We used to think we had until 2050 to zero them out, but new research suggests that we have much less time than that, and yet they're still going up. So we've got to change the direction of that trend. We've got to drive them down rapidly and aggressively. And to me, we we can still use that simple, clear message. We're about a month away from the beginning of COP28, which is going to be a significant moment in international climate diplomacy is we're doing the first global stock take after Paris. Um, and we're trying to, for the third time, have a discussion to your point about a, a clear commitment about the phase out of fossil fuels in order to get emissions rapidly decreasing. This is a climate tech podcast, so we're not anti-technology, but there does seem to be a debate about the role of technology vis-a-vis the need to mitigate emissions faster. So I guess I wanted to get your take as one of the most respected thinkers on climate communications on the planet, how worried we should be about this new research as we move towards COP. I think the biggest fear is that people will feel like it's too late, we're screwed, and we got to give up. And to me, that kind of doomism is is our worst enemy right now, Mm -hmm. because 
if you think we're doomed, then why bother doing anything? So that to me, it leads to the same inaction as denialism. And I think it's not honest. My colleague and friend, Mike Mann, likes to say, look, it's not a question of whether we're effed or not effed. It's I a question of how effed. Right. And I, I think that's right. And I think it's honest. You know, we're, it's too late to prevent dangerous climate change. We're already experienced dangerous climate change, right? We saw that this summer. We see it with extreme weather. We see it with the way we're blowing these records out of the water and every single level, you know, whether it's ocean heat or the hottest year on record or the hottest summer year on record by huge margins. Mike Mann has talked about in terms of doomism being the new denialism, and that's the danger. And I was at an event earlier today at Chatham House, I don't know if you're familiar with it, in London, where I was talking to uh, uh, the you know, Bloomberg Green columnist and podcaster Akshat Rati and uh, Solitaire Townsend, who is a respected climate communicator, and similarly talking about the danger of, of fatalism. A lot of the people who might be listening to this also advise corporate clients who might be in the energy space, they might be in, in startups. I, I just got to get your reaction. Is it not, was it not ill-judged given how contingent this 1.5 degree C uh, number, even if it is just a number, and even though any 0.1 degree greater than that is definitely bad and we should definitely do everything to avoid that. But for whatever reason, people have doubled down on that being a metric for the last year in particular. And I suppose that's the thing that's concerning is the reaction that people might have or, or how that might be used. So do you think that was a mistake for, for policymakers to continue to bang that drum of 1.5 when clearly that was something that perhaps was not something that would be sustainable? I think people need a target. You know, sometimes it's a stretch target. You know, it's a stretch goal, right? But we need a goal. We need a target. And so I think it was set as a target. I can remember because I have been in this so long, we still were talking when I got started in this about limiting the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to 350 parts per million. I mean, we know at 420, right? Yeah. We passed that 350 exit a long time ago. And so I think what's really important for people to understand and from a, you know, messaging storytelling point of view, it's not a cliff we fall off when we get to 1.5. It's not like, at below 1.5, we're safe, and beyond 1.5, we're screwed. It's not like that. It's more like we're on the CO2 highway. And if you miss your exit on a highway, what do you do? You slow down and you get off at the next exit, right? You don't just keep going until you hit the coast. Right. So if we miss 1.5, we slow down and we make 1.6. So we slow down and we make 1.7. Because as you said, every tenth of a degree matters. Every fraction matters in terms of impacts. Another metaphor would be it's more like a minefield. The mm. further we walk out onto that minefield, the more we risk being blown up, right? right? So we want to not go too far. And so I think there's ways of thinking about this that do not require abandoning the one and a half degree goal. It was always stated as, look, we're going to avoid passing two degrees C. We're going to try best efforts. Now, we also know that we may overshoot 1.5 and that over time we might be able to bring the temperature back down. That's a longer term prospect. But it's really important for people to understand why this is happening and what we can do about it. So I like to talk about what we're facing in terms of three big gaps. One, there's an ambition gap right? Our policies, our discussions at the conference of the parties, all of that is not ambitious enough. We're not having the conversations we need to have about phasing out fossil fuels, about the much larger commitments. We mm -hmm. can't talk about peaking a decade from now. We need to right. talk about peaking now. Emissions need to start coming down right away. So there's an ambition gap. Two, there's an implementation gap. We have these pledges that countries have made but we don't have the policies in place yet in most countries to implement those pledges. So there's an implementation gap. And mm -hmm. third, there's a production gap. The world is on track to produce twice the fossil fuels, twice in mm -hmm. 2030, as would be consistent with the 1.5 degree target. 
clearly, as you've said, we have not had the hard conversations that we need to have about phasing out fossil fuels. And we have to have a different system that does not allow one country or two countries to veto a plan that the rest of the world agrees to. And that's what's preventing us from getting the language we need to get, and not just the language, but the policies and the implementation of a fossil fuel stays out. Right. So one of the things that's flagged very heavily is the, the interest of Dr. Sultan Al-Jaber of making climate tech very much part of the conversation in this COP in Dubai. It was something Jim Ski recognized when he, he spoke about this in his, his first big interview with BBC recently as being something that'll be different about this COP. 28. Every COP has a different character. And I think uh, given the next one is taking place in the Middle East, there will be a big emphasis on technology and innovation. The countries there are very concerned about hydrogen, carbon capture and storage. Solitaire Tanzend has a very good line about the kinds of narratives to be able to think about climate. And one of them has been the Iron Man narrative, right? This techno-optimism where technology is going to save us from ourselves and perhaps make us not have to endure some of the consequences of the choices that we perhaps should have made 20 years ago. There's this hope that whether it's CCU West or green hydrogen or some other technology that'll just come to be able to wipe away the mistakes that we've made before. We work with a lot of folks who are all very well intentioned, trying to make a trying to make a business, trying to make a difference as well. What is your advice for the balance that needs to be struck between being aware of others who might want to use that narrative of suggesting that technology can save us and save us for avoiding having to make these hard choices in the short term? Uh, and actually still pursue something that might be a worthwhile goal in the long term, technologically. So technology is wonderful, and we should continue to innovate. I think it's a mistake to th say that technology will save us. I, I see that technology is important, but it's not everything. Policies are essential. And one of the funny things about cutting carbon emissions is there is a time value to carbon. Changes we make now are more valuable and more important than changes we make later. We can't wait for technology to save us because we will cross thresh thresholds. There are thresholds in the climate system. We have already crossed some of them. There is already some melting going on in West Antarctica that we are not going to be able to stop. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of these thresholds in the climate system. And when you pass them, you don't know exactly where they are except in the rear view mirror. So, once you've passed them, oops, we passed that threshold. We're now committed to huge amounts of change where nature takes over and we can't stop it. So if you're waiting for technology to save us, it's a mistake. We've got to go to war with the army we have. The technologies we have right now in solar, in wind, in battery storage, are energy efficiency, really important. And we've got to use them now to phase out coal very quickly. There is no reason to be building any new coal plants. We've, similarly, we've got to phase out methane gas. Mm -hmm. I won't call it natural gas because that's a PR term that's good for that industry, but right. it's nothing natural about digging up billion-year-old methane and releasing it to the atmosphere in the blink of an eye. So there's, we have to use the technologies we have because we can't wait for fusion. Fusion's always 20 years away at any right. Time. It's always still 20 years away. We can't mm -hmm. wait for technology to save us. We need the policies in place now. We need to make decisions now at every level, from the personal level to the state, to the national, to the international level. We've got to make the decisions that are going to put us on the right track now. If we get some great technological breakthroughs, wonderful. They'll help right. us down the line. But there's no way that we can count on that. And we can't wait. It's super helpful. One of the things we want to point listeners towards is the, the great piece that you wrote for Scientific American earlier this year. You've really distilled down, I think, a lot of your work in terms of really pointing out that the scientific terms that are used and how they translate into the public meaning and then the better choice that we could be using. You, you go through everything from climate change itself and talking about being climate disruption, being a better choice, because it, it basically assigns a different meaning to that to, as you've just mentioned, natural gas being methane gas, 
mm-hmm. and negative emissions being CO2 removal or drawdown. Yeah. I suppose one thing that's come up very prominently over the last six months is unabated. Your whole thing has been about clarity mm-hmm. in word choice. Do you worry that there are forces or, or people who are working to actually undermine clarity? Um, and are you that unabated is one of those terms that might fall into that category? Oh, absolutely. Um, so theory is a great example of that. We know that a theory is something that's very well established in science and can be used to make predictions, right? But there are people who know that the public meaning of theory is, oh, it's just a hunch or a guess. So they'll repeat, global warming is only a theory, mm-hmm. right? And I say, well, you know, gravity is only a theory too. Yes. You stick up a clip, you're going down. There are certainly those who will use a term like unabated because they know that not everyone really understands what they mean by that. And of Mm -hmm. course, there is no real abatement. I mean, this is still a a pie in the sky technology, this notion that we're going to be able to capture the carbon and and permanently sequester it. It's already sequestered. Leave it there. This notion that we can abate this, that we're talking about carbon capture and storage as though it's a, a done deal. And it's not. The infrastructure that would be necessary to do this on the scale required to really make a difference is so enormous and would be so expensive that it makes no sense to consider continuing to use these fuels, these dirty fuels, and to think, oh, we're going to spend the money and do all this tech to capture it. Why not just use the cheaper, available, clean technologies now? That's what makes more sense. We want to solve this problem. We want to solve it as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. We don't want to solve it the most expensive way possible, right? So some people are real big fans of nuclear power. I'm not against it, uh, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, but I know that nuclear power is still the most expensive and complicated way humanity has ever figured out to boil water. I don't think that it really makes sense to say this is the way to go, right? You want to do this as inexpensively and as quickly as possible. And solar and wind and battery storage are fast and they're cheap. And so why do something that's going to take a really long time and be really expensive? It's going to hurt us because of that time value of carbon that we were talking about. You've spoken extensively about the framing of how to describe the different choices that are in front of us and avoiding things that put us into a, a kind of degrowth kind of mindset and talking about sacrifice and talking about the fact, as someone I heard earlier today say, we're not going to be asking everyone to sit around eating grass is probably not a great message. Um, yes. I, as, a, as opposed to the future can be better, cheaper, faster, brighter, shinier, et cetera. How would you advise some of the people listening to this podcast to be able to argue for the technologies that you've already mentioned, the things that are the lowest cost, the most direct, the ones that you know don't involve turning ourselves into pretzels to be able to satisfy existing vested interests. How can you advise them to get their message across more clearly to win these arguments? Yeah. So I think it really is about painting the picture for people of the better world that we're creating. This is not about sacrifice. This is not about deprivation. It's not about giving anything up. So we don't want fossil fuels. What we want is cold beer and hot showers, right? We want the energy services that are provided. And if we can get mobility and the cold beer and all of the other services that we want with clean, renewable energy, of course we would choose that. And it's going to make the world better in so many ways. Similarly, a plant-based diet makes us healthier, right? This is not a sacrifice. You know, I eat a vegetarian substitute, vegetarian version of meatballs. I had it last night. Meatballs and spaghetti was great. And then no animals died. It's healthier for me. It's better for the planet. It's better for the climate. It's better for the animals. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about creating a better world with cleaner air, healthier, more walkable communities, better economic and job growth, less expensive energy, healthy bodies. Why wouldn't we want that? We want to create that better world. We're not talking about sacrifice. We're talking about improvement in every aspect of our lives. That choice is ours. That's super helpful. Listen, Susan, I I know that you've been, again, you're very busy, so generous with your time. Um, Before we let you go, I just wonder if you can offer any final thoughts for 
folks listening to this who are working in climate tech, who are inspired by your work over the years, whether they're in communications or they're setting up their own business and trying to figure out the story that they're going to tell, what is your parting words and thoughts that might help keep them going? Yeah, I would, I would stress telling the positive story of the world that we're creating to remind people that we are already on our way. Most of the new energy that's being deployed is clean energy. We are not starting from scratch. That's very important because psychologically, it's very difficult for people when they hear something like, well, we need to remake the entire planet's energy system. It, it seems so overwhelming. It seems so impossible. But if you tell them most of the new energy being deployed now is clean energy, most of the plants being retired are dirty energy. They're coal plants. So we're already on our way. But there's so much more to do. And when we do it, it's a great, exciting future. It's better for the economy. It's better for us. And that's the direction we all want to go. That's a perfect place to leave it, I think, Susan. And thank you so much. Where could people find more of your work? So you can send them to my website, climatecommunication.org. There's the whole story of climate change under these three black tabs. What's happening to our climate? How is it affecting us and what can we do about it? There's also under the resources, there's articles that include the 15 op-eds I've published in the last two years, as well as the Scientific American piece and other pieces under videos. There's the BBC News uh, live interview that I did on the language of climate change. So you'll find lots more information at my website if you want to learn more about my thoughts on this whole big picture. Thank you so much, Susan. It was my pleasure to talk to you. Really appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I don't know about you, but I feel a whole lot better for hearing someone with Susan's experience as a climate communicator talk about this. As you can hear, Django, our chief canine officer, is also very calm and indeed snoring in the background. But this isn't Susan's first rodeo. She's seen climate targets that have slipped before, but through the years, she's maintained her sense of mission and urgency calling out people, twisting language to sow doubt and confusion that enabled delay, but remembering the big story. That this is a story of progress towards a better future that's possible and profitable. If we can find the words that bring others with us. Tell us what you think. You can email us at info at wickedproblems.uk. Hit us up in blue sky at delavan.bsky.social and ask Katan Joshi to add you to the hashtag green sky feed there and you can always find myself and our co-host Claire Brady on LinkedIn if you're a subscriber there will also be a secret bonus episode of another legendary communicator that you'll find at news of wicked problems UK this week and the third and final episode in this series will come out Wednesday where we'll look at Akshat Bhatti's new book climate capitalism and how his stories about solutions offer lessons for how you might want to think about the stories you're trying to tell. Thanks for listening to Wicked Problems. We'll be back soon.